great. Um, uh, yet we're, we are not yet a public, uh, we, we haven't had our public release, but we're gearing up for that um, uh, in, uh, in early June at the AAS meeting in Austin. And so uh, while you know, all the core functionality is there, we are still in the process of pulling it together and making it look clean. So you're seeing a, a, a beta release version uh, uh, of it. And so there may be some hiccups, but um, uh, you guys are uh, uh, hopefully a great test audience. Um, and what we're going to do is I'm going to give a brief introduction on the motivation and some of the things that we'd uh, like you to be able to do with the data lab. Uh, Stephanie and Robert will uh, show you science examples that, that expose some of the things that you can do with the data lab. Um, and then for the hack sessions, we've put in a few hack ideas into the, into the Google Doc. Um, and uh, for the hack session, we have an additional notebook, which is sort of a, um, you know, here are all the things to do to get basic access to the data and the services that we're providing for the data lab. Um, so uh, what I would uh, recommend is we're going to go through our intro and the science examples. If you're interested in any of the data lab related hack ideas and, and you want to you get into it, um, uh, maybe we could go through that basic access notebook at the first part of the hack session for the interested audience and, um, uh, and, then, and, then, and, then, uh, and then go and do hacking. Um, if you want to hack on other things, of course, you don't, you don't have to pay attention to it. Um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll get to the, to the user accounts in just a, in just a bit. Um, so so the, the motivation, okay, so the, the first thing I'm going to show you, uh, so NYO has been taking images on its telescope for a long time, We've been around for 50 years, we had our 50th anniversary celebration a couple of, or a few years ago. Um, uh, uh, and um, but only for the last um, 15 or so years have we had a, an archive uh, where the data are stored digitally. We can download it. Um, and so back in 2004, uh, the instruments that we were operating that really produced sort of big images were the mosaic cameras. Uh, but since then, we've we've commissioned the dark energy camera on our telescope in the south, the Blanco four meter at San Tololo, um, and also. Uh, other generations of the Mosaic cameras, including the most recent one, Mosaic 3 in the north on the, on the Kip Peak uh, Mayall telescope. Um, and, and these are producing a lot of data. So we, ha we have a little movie that shows basically a, a, a map of exposure time at any point on the sky um, on a log scale. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna play that movie forward. It's maybe likely to pause. So it starts in 2004. Um, and you can, uh, yeah, so let's stop there. I'm just going to start again. <clears throat> so starting in 2004, um, and this was around the time when we started having a survey program. You can start to see, you know, data building up, but it's really just kind of assaulting across the sky. Um, and you can pick out some interesting surveys. People like to focus on the galactic plane, etc. As soon as 2012 rolls around and the dark energy camera is commissioned, the sky really starts to fill in. Uh, you can start to see the dark energy survey outline forming here. This is um, the decal survey, which uh, we're going to feature in some of these notebooks. And later on, you'll start to see the northern hemisphere filling in, too, as the, the northern DESI targeting survey starts to uh, uh, start um, data collection. Um, and, and so when you added up uh, the amount of imaging data that we now have um, in our archive is more than 400 terabytes. Uh, it's a running number, uh, you know, sort of you know, tens of terabytes per month. Um, and, and, and so th this, this is really the, you know, the first motivation for the data lab is that you know, these, this is a huge imaging data set. Um, and one can do great science out of these imaging data sets. There is, of course, you know, uniform surveys like the Dark Energy Survey and decals um, uh, that are very large, but the community is also defining surveys uh, that aren't part of these two groups um, to essentially make a crowdsourced survey of the sky. And um, there's not just images, there's also catalogs. So this is our, uh, our most, uh, this is the largest catalogs that we have in-house uh, today. It's not, it's not everything, but um, 
this is the decals DR3 release. Uh, so that's from the, the DEC, um, one of the DESI targeting surveys. And this is from SMASH, uh, the survey for which David Nidever is the PI here, he's there in the room. Um, and together, this adds up to about 900 million objects, uh, which, which is a, a very large catalog that uh, you don't necessarily just want to transfer over the network and start using on your laptop. It's really too big for that. Um, what's coming, so this is not yet publicly available, but when you have a large image, imaging data set, uh, one of the, uh, the most natural things to do is to create a large catalog out of it. Um, and so David has been running um, uh, all of the public imaging, uh, starting with dark energy camera that's available in our, in our archive, and putting it through a source extractor based pipeline and created a catalog of the sky, uh, or of the southern sky. Um, and this just shows the object density here at every point on the sky. It contains around 2.3 yeah, 2 billion objects and a total of 19 billion measurements because some points of the sky are multiply imaged right, in, in many images. Um, uh, this will, uh, in the not too distant future, become publicly available. Um, it doesn't replace the sort of the, um, the catalogs that would come out of the big surveys themselves, or that people might generate themselves, because it's a you know a fairly quick um, uh, just aperture photometry-based reduction of the imaging. Whereas, for instance, the dark energy survey and decals and other programs uh, do more sophisticated reductions. Uh, but it's a preview of things to come. And so, in order to make efficient use of, um, uh, of this catalog data and the imaging data, um, you need an environment uh, 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 you know, to, to be able to work on these things close to the data themselves. That's, that's kind of the, the idea. This is um, an idea that's cropping up in many places, an idea that will be very relevant to LSST, it's of course relevant to uh, Sloan, uh, to PanSTARS. Um, and, and this is this is how we imagine you know, our imaging data sets and the catalogs and eventually spectroscopic data sets uh, uh, that you'll be able to work with them inside this environment. You'll still be able to download stuff, of course, but hopefully you can, uh, we can reduce things to a size and it makes it um, uh, make sense to download things uh, uh, other than just you know, the giant catalogs. So uh, at, you know, at the basis of this environment, which we call the data lab, will be large catalogs. So these are terabyte scale uh, databases, um, uh, up to tens of terabytes. Um, we have access to all the pixel data, so the 400 terabytes in the, in the um, NOAO Science Archive, and we want to be able to connect you know, searches of uh, catalog objects uh, to the pixel data so you can get image cutouts of things, and we'll show some examples of that. Um, uh, and one of the core uh, pieces of infrastructure is virtual storage um, to work with uh, you know, the outputs of queries, um, uh, outputs of image cutout requests, uh, so that each user will have some space to, to put their stuff and you can share that, that space with your collaborators. Um, we want to be able to enable analysis and data exploration using you know, the tools that, that you are familiar with. So, uh, uh, for instance, running uh, uh, Jupyter Notebooks um, and accessing data services to get the data out, and then you can just you know, do your visualization there. Um, uh, compute processing, so Narav talked about uh, you know, uh, containers and running at scale. Uh, we don't have um, you know, a, a data center of the size of Exceed like or, or NCSA or NERSC, uh, but we do have you know, more compute processing than you know, a typical person will have on their desktop, and so we, we will have a compute processing service based on containers that you can put your jobs in um, and run them. This is not something that we can show you yet because uh, it's not part of the, the initial public release. Um, so we, we don't have containers running workflows on our data just yet. But the nice thing about the containers, as, as Narav explained, is that you can put something in them. And th those are transportable to various places because you know, these large scale computing centers uh, can handle the containers. Um, and another, another set of features relates to uh, being able to share your own data sets that you might create. So if you have a survey uh, uh, using NOAO telescopes um, and you create a catalog, you can, you can publish those data sets and expose them to the community inside this environment. That, that's, that's, the, that's the idea. Oh yeah, this, 
for some reason the formatting screws up here. Um, okay, so I'm going to just go here. Uh, so what can you do now? I'm not going to go through uh, each of these in detail because Stephanie and Robert will show that in, um, uh, uh, in their notebooks. But we are going to be, for the hack session today, giving you a piece of paper with a username and a password. Um, this is a temporary user account, so uh, we can't promise that they will be that they will stick around uh, now for the end of time. Basically, at the public release, we're going to wipe everything and start over again. So anything that you do in the hack session today, it'll it'll be around for a few weeks, uh, uh, maybe you know two to three weeks or something. Um, so if you if you like what you did uh, during the hack session using the data lab, you should transfer it. Uh, somewhere uh, afterwards, at least the, the code parts of it. Um, and you know, there are, we have notebooks that show you then how to interact with your with your account. Um, we have exploration tools. So if you visit our visit this uh, uh, the web page, um, you can you can find this data discovery tool. One of the hack sessions has another catalog exploration tool that I'll that I'll show you. This tap service is. Um, a table access protocol service. It gives you a view into our uh, database content. So you can click on, uh, so here is the legacy survey DR3. You can get the schema of things. So here's tractor primary. Uh, so Stephanie will be will be talking about this. But this, this page gets you um, an overview and also a query interface to all the catalogs that we have. Um, so you can click on that link. I'm not going to, there is how to notebooks on how to use the query manager for to interface with the queries, um, how to get image uh, cutouts, which Robert will talk about, how to interact with the virtual storage space. Um, and also we've been using um, the, uh, the data lab as the release point of a couple of surveys. Uh, so the Smash uh, survey has a full description here. Uh, you can see what's in the um, what's in that survey, and it has tools like this uh, custom exploration tool, which uh, has a you know spinnable sky based on a light and light, and you can overplot uh, catalog objects there, and 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 just have a look and just to just to see just to see what's in there. Um, uh, do you have a couple of hack ideas? We can maybe talk about that later. Uh, um, particularly this catalog exploration tool. Maybe I can just show. Um, so this is something that we're looking at for Smash. So here, here you have an image of the sky, and as you zoom in, and of course this is you know, quite buggy, um, you you get uh, you know, what the catalog is like. It gives you the number of sources and um, no access labels, but. Uh, um, sort of the range of things. This is a G minus R versus G color magnitude diagram. So it can help you design searches. This is something I'd like to I'd like to hack on actually. Um, so I'm going to turn this um, over now to Robert to go next. Um, he's going to start the, the first science example. And while he's setting up, I, I could take any questions of so sort of the broad general nature. So I have a I have a question. Yes. Yeah. Um, what future data sets do you plan to ingest into the data lab? Yeah, so, so, so the, the, the biggest future data set that uh, we will have is the DES DR1 uh, release. So that uh, comes out in mid-December. Um, and so for that, we are working on uh, designing our database system to be able to handle, uh, you can do this, um, to handle a uh, catalog of that size. Um, the All Sky Catalog, we, we have a plan for you know, um, uh, you know, increasingly sophisticated versions of that. So that's a, that's a large data set. Um, we already have you know, things like Gaia DR1. Um, we have a plan underway to, we have some Sloan tables now, not everything. Uh, but uh, a goal for us is to, is to be a release, you know, a, a place that hosts the Sloan data. So um, yeah. Okay. Turn off the you want you want him to set up recording or no? Um, uh, it's okay. I, yeah. I think we should just we can continue. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Hi, so my name is Robert. I'm working at NOIO here as a survey data scientist with Data Lab since September last year. And uh, I'm going to show you the, what is the purpose of, of having something like Data Lab around with data sets that large that you cannot download them, you cannot process them, you cannot um, download any sizable chunk on your, onto your computers and then work on them. So that's why you want to bring the computation um, to the data locally so they don't have to transfer anything. And uh, Stephanie and I, would, uh, we were going to show you in, in two examples, actually minus two examples, and she will have to show another one, what you can do with Data Lab. It's uh, not exhaustive at all. It's barely scratches the surface of what you can do with Data Lab, and it's meant to inspire you to, to explore and to try to play around. All the notebooks, by the way, Knut's, mine, and Stephanie's will be available or are available for you, um, so you can play those notebooks, work on them, change things, or in a hack ideas, in a hack session, do, do other things. So I'll be talking about uh, two things that you could do. Since you have access to the images, you can, for instance, search for things like over densities and find dwarf galaxies. That's the first example. And you can do time domain uh, analysis as well, and we'll do that on, a, on an example of a, our Lara star that was found in the little Hydra 2 dwarf galaxy that was discovered in 2015. And we're going to progress naturally from there. So, uh, I'm almost said everything here already. When you, uh, when you run some kind of search, we're going to define it in a second, when you run some kind of search for over densities in the in the image space, uh, you could, for instance, imagine uh, downloading a field at a time, running some kind of convolution kernel over it. That's what we're going to do. Take the difference, find peaks, and, and then look and inspect, because it's very important that the peak that you found is actually some, something that you're looking for, or maybe some spur spurious signal. We put some, some uh, color magnitude diagrams to, to see uh, that what we observe is actually a, a dwarf galaxy. And then in the second example on the uh, LARE, we do uh, long scargo, we compute pterodograms. I don't know if you've have been doing this, this the rest of the week, the past week, but uh, I see head shaking. Or, you know, have you? Okay, then this is going to be a good introduction. So we need to download the data, uh, download or access the data, sorry, I should say. Because <laughs> I've introduced that we don't have to download the data. In, in, in fact, in those examples, we will download chunks of data, but not big ones, it takes a few seconds. Um, for the first example, we're going to use the Smash survey, which David Nagelberg puts this in the back of the PI of, and uh, the survey has been, or the paper of the survey has been submitted, and we'll publish this here, I guess. Um, we only access some kind of, you know, columns from this, from the data, from the database table, uh, the positions and some magnitudes. That's, that's all that's necessary. And for the detection, we're going to run a uh, an algorithm or an idea that people came up with in 2008 already, where you take a Gaussian kernel of a given size, small size. And you convolve the image with it. And then you do the same thing with the larger kernel and subtract them too. And this is the same effect as if running, for instance, a Mexican hat kernel over it and, and capturing everything that is between those two sizes of those kernels, but it rejecting everything that's outside. Let's see how this goes. So, first, we need to import a couple of things. We've been doing this all week, I guess. Um, Astro Pi a lot, certain things. And then, very few things from, from Data Lab. We have authentication client and so on, storage client, but we also have a helpers uh, module which, you know, hides a lot of the boilerplate. You don't have to worry about it. Okay, and, and uh, you can do all the low-level raw access by, you know, providing your own authentication and so on. But with those helper classes, you only have to provide your password and your username. Here it's anonymous and empty, but you will have, like Knut said, a proper password in, in, in an hour. And um, once you authenticate yourself, you have a token, which you then feed into this query helper which we call first, and you have an object that now knows who you are, it can identify you, and can issue queries for you and retrieve the result. So um, one method there is once to see what kind of outputs you can get if you want to download something to your, to your notebook. So for instance, it tells you you can download a, a string, which is a, looks like a CSV file, or a NumPy array, or a structured array, or Pandas data frame, and so on. Anything you'd like to work with, you tell them to do it. And so first you design a query. We're going to query uh, one specific field, because we don't want to do the whole thing. One specific field in Smash, it's a field number 69. We apply some quality flags, like we don't want short exposures, and we want some color range, a magnitude range and some color range. We're looking for blue stars um, uh, in, in the open season, in blue colors. I'll explain in a second why. And so the query that you write is simply a string. It's as simple as you know talking to a, I don't know, a future fridge and say, or oh, this when this price and so on. So it's very simple, you say, select all those rows from this database table where some conditions are met. And that's it. And then you submit, you construct the query, and then you submit it here. 
the object that you just created is you feed the query string, you tell them what output you want, and if you feel fancy and you want to see what you got is actually real numbers, you, you can uh, tell them to preview something for you, and then you see the first rows preview. Looks really like array deck in some magnitudes. And uh, the result is now the pandas data frame stored in this variable. So let's plot it. Uh, let's see maybe, so if you're looking for over densities in space, in spatial uh, uh, coordinates, let's, over, let's plot the distribution of, or the density distribution <coughs> of the coordinates that you just downloaded in our in deck. So with hexpin and, and matplotlib, very easy to do. And this uh, color bar here shows the number of sources per, per spatial bin, some little hexagonal bins. And you might be already able to see with your eye that there's some kind of over density here, maybe. Maybe here, maybe here. But it's not very clear. So let's run this convolution kernel that I was talking about. Uh, you define it here. I just want to show you. It's very easy to do. I mean, it's one function. And it could be really shortened by half because a lot of it is, you know, beautify, uh, beautification uh, code and, and printouts. So uh, yeah, if you have a good, good idea in Python, you can do it in you know, 20 lines of code. Then you run this convolution kernel, differential convolution kernel, with uh, two arguments and 20 argument sizes. It runs literally in a split second. And then you plot the result, which is a differentially convolved image. And it, the peaks stand out, all the peaks that are you know, some sigma above the medium are visible now. Let's find those peaks. Again, very simple. Um, we use some, some, some cans go from somewhere else, from plot utils, a package. There's a function called find peaks. It finds those peaks in, in pixel code and that's for you. And then you can translate it into array index so that you know where the pixels are. Where did it find them? I plot them here in yellow and then in white. These are those, the two only pixels found that had more than 10 sigma distance from, from the medium. But observe that when you do this, uh, this convolution with a, with a Mexican hat uh, Gaussian, that's our kernel, that is very sensitive to lack of discontinuities. For instance, around the edge, you have some over densities. They might be not real, they're likely not real. So you also have to kind of look what you found, whether this is actually a real signal or, or something wrong. Uh, let's look at them. Here comes something beautiful. With data lab or other programs like that, uh, you have access to the catalog data and the pixels, the images. You don't have to know what they are. You only have to know, I know our position in R and deck, and I know I want to see an image that's, let's say, 0.1 degree, square degree on the this, on this sky. Can I look at those images? And uh, it takes a little bit of setup, but not much. Literally, you store three or four lines to tell them where the uh, simple image access service lives. And then you define some, uh, just boilerplate, how to download those files, but it's very simple once you have it. And I also defined a little function of plotting the images later. And here there are, for the, for the yellow uh, thing that was on the edge, we downloaded this. Remember, we're looking for over densities that might be uh, dwarf galaxies. And look what you get, especially in R and I event. This looks like a galaxy cluster. So this is definitely not what you're looking for. It's, some, it's an over density, that's why it, it showed up in the peak finder. But uh, by inspection, and you know, downloading the images really one line then. And, and five seconds of waiting, you see immediately how oh, this is not an, uh, um, a whole galaxy. So it's an interesting design case, but it's not what I'm looking for. How about the other field? Same thing, two lines of code to download and to plot. And there is no galaxy cluster. There is nothing else that looks like, you know, might be not stars. You don't recognize there's a dwarf galaxy, but there is an over density of stars, otherwise it would not have been selected or found by the peak finder. So this is a dwarf galaxy, but you don't see it by eye. It's very faint. Um, this is the whole thing about dwarf galaxies. They're very important in many fields. For instance, uh, they are dominated by, by dark matter. Mm -hmm. So they are a good indicator where, for instance, the, the large gas structure is, is being produced or being uh, uh, located. But uh, they're hard to find because they're very faint. Yeah, dwarf galaxies. Yeah, dwarf galaxies. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> OK. So I think I went too far, yeah. So there's a bunch of stars. The algorithms tell us there's some over density. Let's look at the columnar distribution of stars. Let's download from the catalog all the stars within, let's say, five um, arc minutes around the, the position uh, of the peaks. And then once you've downloaded it, you can just compute colors. So these things were downloaded, and these two columns we computed ourselves. Yeah, for the other peak, and now I'm plotting them, those two. So for the first one, we found 2,300 stars. For the other, a similar number, 2,200. Color magnitude uh, diagram, uh, G magnitude of a color. And you see, they're very similar, although there's differences. There's something here 
the kind of blue. This, this is the blue horizontal branch star, stars. And there's an opacity here, which you don't see here in the column on the diagram. If you compare this with the paper that was actually, where this uh, star was, where this um, dwarf galaxy was found in 2016, they all looked here in blue an isochrome of very old stars, 13 giga years, and very metal poor, very metal poor. And these are stars that are typically found in, 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 in dwarf galaxies. So see, this is a signature of a dwarf galaxy plus some, some branch of, of very blue um, of horizontal branch stars. Okay, so that was the first example. Now we're moving to the next one, but it's kind of connects because we're gonna study this star here. It was discovered here and through this study. It's a variable star and it's very regular and it's one, uh, an auralari star and they pulsate always with a very specific uh, period, um, somewhere between seven hours and 24 hours or something like that. And uh, we, can, we have the data for that uh, in the same database, just different table. We can download all the light bursts for this star particular star. It's just a different table in the same in the same database. So we're downloading here the positions, the <coughs> modified Julian dates, so that you know when the observation was taken as a function of time, the magnitude column, and then a column that uh, runs alongside it so that you can tell actually what band you're using <coughs> it. Because for like if you want to set one band on <laughs> sorry, that's the error on this. Again, very, very easy to download. The data frame is a famous data frame here. You could make a NAMPI array, whatever you wanted. Query string that you just pro uh, produced here, and that's it. <coughs> Let's plot it. So there are data two years ago, some data a year ago, and then when those researchers, like Knut himself here and David, realized that it might be a variable star, they went ahead and took many more data over two nights uh, recently. And so the hot light curve looks like this. It's very hard to see, but when you zoom in on this, you see there's a very distinct shape pattern in all three bands. Actually, it's a five band, but we only see data in three bands here. So once you have such a light curve that looks like a variable star, might be a bit too periodic, let's try to find a period. So there are um, many different algorithms, or several different algorithms, how to find a period uh, reliably. But some of them work in the Fourier domain, where you take a Fourier like a transform of the, of the light curve. And that's what we're going to use here. Others are, you know, uh, phase uh, minimization, phase dispersion minimization methods that are complementary. We're going to see in a second how this compares. And so, uh, thanks to uh, you know things like AstroPy and, and, and uh, you know efforts from the community to to improve AstroPy and other things, we have something like Long's Scarlet program just canned in one function in, in AstroPy. You literally take your time, your magnitude, and the error, and you compute the Long Scarlet program in in one second. So if you set it up here, you can do it. Sorry. So the output of this, of, of, mo of most of those methods, is actually a frequency or a period as a function of the power story of contained at every frequency at every period. This one computes the frequency, so the period is one over that. And uh, the best one is where the most power is contained. Let's see how that looks. It looks like that. It's not clean, has lots of jagged structures, has lots of aliasing because you're observing typically only you know, at the beginning of the night or end of the night, and then you don't observe for 12 hours. Plus, also for this particular source, you know, the data is only from one year, then a year later, and then two nights, and that's it. But still, you have a very pronounced main, main peak with sub peaks. And if you assume that the, the highest sub peak in the main main peak has the highest power, then that's your period, best period. It's something like 0 0.4, 6, 4, 8 days. And now comes the nice thing this paper from the other authors in 2016, Viva Setar, they used a different method, not a Fourier based method at all. And they found a very similar period. So this is great confirmation that you're, you're doing something right. Once you have the period, sorry, once you have the period, you can now do something called phasing. You phase the entire light curve. It could be two years, it could be 10 years, whatever, with that period. So the first line of the code is very simple. This is the observation time divided by the length of one period, 0.6 days. So how many periods fit in that observation? And then you take just a reminder uh, of it. So basically, you remove all the, f the repeating, the end, the integer repeatings of, of, a, of a phase, and you only take a fractional thing. And you, so every uh, every uh, observation time t becomes now a fractional number between zero and one. And now you can plot all the data points, not just from the zoomed in region, but all the data points as a function of their phase. And you get this beautiful light curve, which literally, uh, literally uh, really actually looks like a, a RLR a light curve, which uh, they pulsate very fast up and then decay slowly. The long scarlet uh, method is a very popular one. It allows you also to compute a simple long scarlet model. I'm just overplotting it in blue. And you see it's not very good. 
it's just a sinusoid through the right period, but it doesn't reproduce the data at all. So one of the hack ideas, of course, for you if you're interested to uh, you know, do some fitting, some more physical, more realistic models. For instance, uh, there are our templates that you can use to fit. And here I have some resources, some of them talk about that, if you want to uh, hack on this this afternoon. There are other things, like the papers that I was mentioning, and uh, more on our, our large star samples on the algorithm that uh, you use to, you know, to convolve, uh, to convolve uh, a distribution of uh, RA index numbers, values. And so some of the hacking ideas that uh, you might be interested in working, and if you are, then talk to us. You can find over densities elsewhere, not just in the one field that I showed you. There's many, many fields. If you want to run this whole thing on the sky, you cannot finish today, for sure. <laughs> but um, you could discover something that nobody else knew, you know, some, some dwarf galaxy for instance, over density that is unknown yet. I mentioned already the more physical models for our Lara stars, um, and also, you could, for instance, try, because I know that you've been working on uh, learning about uh, classification a lot, you could try to find all, define all first, but all variable stars in, in some of those surveys and classify them using random forest or some kind of machine learning. Tell them, try to tell what is the quasar, what is the variable star, what is our larry, and so on. So if you're interested in this, we'll be happy to, you know, assist and, and help if we can. And now I'm going to turn it over to Stefan, who's going to do another time. I'm also part of the data lab here at NOAO. So right now I'm just going to go through another science example. So this is going through a Jupyter notebook. Um, so you don't have to read all the text. I'll mostly highlight the important points. But you should know that the text is there if you want to go ahead and read the full notebook. And um, the idea is that this is going to be using a particular data set. So which was mentioned a couple of times already by Knud and Robert. So it's the DCALS, which is a dark energy camera legacy survey. So this is a big imaging survey in preparation for DESI. Uh, so DECALS, there's a couple of links. So you can actually go to the team website and the data lab also has its own page for that project. Um, so the idea is that DESI will uh, target over 30 million objects to take spectra, but we need to know where to place the fiber. So this is an imaging survey to cover 14,000 square degrees in total. The decals portion is more like 9,000 square degrees. And right now, the data release tree is about half of that. So there's already a lot of data. There's like over 4,000 square degrees already of imaging. So Okay, so this is just a small uh, fraction of the survey, so you can see the kind of uh, data that we have. This is a color image made with three bands, so the bands are called G, R, and Z. And then if I try to zoom in a bit here. So what you can see is a combination of stars that are in the foreground in our own Milky Way galaxy, but then also there's a lot of distant galaxies and quasars and other objects. So this one is a star, can I tell you by eye? <laughs> uh, and this is a galaxy, I'm, for, I'm sure of it here because I can see it's a little bit blurred. But it, yeah, anyway, as you can see, there's a lot of objects and we're not gonna go about classifying them visually or by, by hand. Um, so what we have right now is a catalog of all the photometry in all the separate bands. And then also we can make colors and we can have uh, this optical data is supplemented by WISE imaging, so WISE is an infrared satellite. So we have actually quite a lot of information already in this big catalog that we have ingested in the database. Okay, so now the main problem is to say if we want to choose galaxies, we want to choose quasars, we want to choose also specific types of galaxies, how do we go about doing that? 
So the DESI team is already starting to develop some target selection algorithms. And then there's an early version which was applied to select some sources. So this is a bit hard to see, probably from the back, let me try to zoom in a bit here. All right, so this is an early version of the algorithm. And of course, from the back, maybe it's very hard to see, but these are selected different types of objects. And then the acronyms QSO is for Quasar, LRG is for Luminous Red Galaxies. And we can already see by eye this one looks like a Luminous Red Galaxy. <laughs> uh, and then ELGs are emission line galaxies which are going to be probably the most numerous uh, targets, and they're going to be used to some extent also as fillers for the, for the fibers. But So there's already some kind of algorithm in place, but still, this uh, what I wanted to show you today is uh, basically getting interested in this problem, in this question. How do we classify these different types of objects based on, on catalogs? So what the catalog tells us, so I already mentioned the photometry, so how bright is the object in different bands and different filters, but we also have some shapes, some shape parameters. So the catalog will fit, uh, this is called a tractor, uh, the, the, the tool which is used to extract information, and it's forward modeling, and it's actually modeling all the galaxies and all the bands at having a certain shape. So how is the shape decided? So the simplest shapes you can have, one is the PSF, so that's just a point spread function. So whatever, uh, I guess the seeing and the instrument, if you had the perfect point source, you would still have a certain shape, so that's a point spread fu function. And then there's something called SIMP, which stands for simple galaxies. Simple galaxies are round, they have an exponential profile, but a fixed size. So it's a very simple model, as the name suggests. So everything is fit with PSF and, and simple models. And then if the source is, um, is significant, so more than a five sigma detection, it's kept. Uh, otherwise, it's thrown out. But if it's quite significant, it's going to be fit again with a more complicated model. So if it's a simple galaxy, you say, well, maybe it's not that simple, you know, because galaxies are people too. So, <laughs> um, so basically, then uh, the code will try an exponential model, which is like what you have for these galaxies. Again, I'll zoom in here. And of course, these are very uh, kind of more beautiful than a typical image we have. But anyway, so these, uh, if you look at the light profile, it, it's a as a function of radius from the center, it has an exponential profile. And the elliptical galaxies have what we call double couleur. I'm sorry, I cannot say with English accent this. <laughs> 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 profile, which is a steeper profile with a more luminous core in the center of that galaxy. So this is an elliptical galaxy and a star galaxy. And then a, a quasar, or QSO, looks like a star. So this is what QSO stands for, actually, quasi stellar object. So it's also a PSF. And I'm not showing a picture of a star, but a star would also be PSF. OK. So then, to continue, the catalog, uh, no, sorry, tractor will fit exponential disk or the cooler, depending. Uh, and then, depending on what fits best, and if the new fit is, is uh, improves the old fit by over 3 sigma, <coughs> then this more complicated model is kept. So you have to make another improvement in the fitting. Like I said, it's another 3 sigma improvement which is defined from the a change in the chi-square, actually. And then lastly, if it's exponential or double couleur, then you can try to fit again with a composite of the two. Because sometimes you can have a, a galaxy that has a disk, so exponential, but it has a bulge in the middle, which is like a small elliptical galaxy in the middle. So you can have also a composite, and same idea. So if the, the composite fit uh, model is kept only if it improves again, the fit by three sigma again. So it really has to be significant to go to, to increasing complexity in the models. But in the end, the final result is that these, these five types of objects in a catalog. So you have the magnitudes, which you can use to get colors, and you have the type. And in, in addition, for the ones that have a varying size, uh, even for the PSF, you have a size. And then for uh, exponentials and the, and the color, they're not necessarily round. They, they have some ellipticity. So you also have ellipticities. For example, at this galaxy, if it's inclined, it, it's going to be much more stretched out, so you get an electricity, electricity measurement. So there's actually a lot of information. So in this notebook, I'm not using everything, so I'm going to start here by... Uh, again, let's get this. Okay, so I already mentioned that we have GRZ um, bands, which are obtained with DCAM, but we're also using WISE. 3.4 and 4.6 microns, so these are infrared photometry. And uh, WISE was re-extracted at the position of these galaxies, so it means that we can go a bit fainter than the public WISE catalogs. Okay, so 
this is uh, basically just writing a query, and it's a bunch of comments here because I'm explaining what the different quantities are, but I can just tell you. So basically, we're getting the positions, RA deck, GRZ, uh, YS1, YS2 magnitudes, and some pre-computed colors, and the type, so very SPSF simple and all that, um, from the main tractor catalog of legacy survey, which DECALS is part of, data release three, and I'm requiring that all three bands, G, R, and Z, have at least more than, uh, more than one observation, so two and more, uh, and that, of course, we have valid numbers. So we might have a cleaner catalog later. At the moment, there's a lot of you know, funny numbers in there, or not a number. Okay, but uh, and this example here, I'm stopping the query at 100,000 just for the purpose of registrations, but there's actually many more objects in there. Okay, so for this 100,000, it takes about 1.8 seconds was the query time to get all that, and then this is kind of just a glimpse of the numbers. Why do you see galaxies? Yeah. Is it selecting galaxies? No, did I see galaxies somewhere? Oh, it reads number of galaxies. Oh. <laughs> 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 I'm like, what are these stars things? No, sorry. This is objects. Number of objects. My bad. <laughs> Guilty. Personal bias. <laughs> 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 okay. I still like you even if you don't work in galaxies. Okay. All right. So optical color, color diagram. So here uh, I'm getting the G minus R color and the R minus Z color. And uh, just making, this is a density plot using a hex bin, so it has this hexagonal bins. And you can see here already by eye that there's some very interesting structure in there. So one thing I noticed is like this kind of a skinny bent branch over here, and then there's another branch that seems to be curved and above it, and then there's kind of a cloud here. So what is going on? Uh, so we can tell a little bit more. Uh, already by just using the very simple type from the catalog. So this is basically repeating the same thing, except a loop over the type of object, whether they're PSF, simple, exponential, double clue, or composite. Uh, and then so, so I'm making here a six panel plot. Uh, so looping over this and having um, the result at the bottom. So it's again hex bin, same as the previous plot. Let me zoom again. Okay. So this is already interesting. Uh, so this is everything here on, on the top left. And you can see in the middle, this is only PSF. So PSF, you would expect to have stars and maybe some quasars in there. Uh, so this skinny branch that we could already see before is the stellar locus, basically. So this is where the stars are. But then there's also these PSF that are not in that branch. So what's going on? Are there QSOs? Is there something else going on? Some bad photometry? I'm not sure. So and then you can see that that second branch that lies above and that's curved more that way. This one seems to be made out of some simple galaxies, as well as exponential and the Buchler, these kind of more elliptical galaxies, which seem to have together make a galaxy branch. So this is not that convenient because the solar branch and the galaxy branch are kind of crossing. So we might want to investigate other colors, see if we can get a better separation. So this next figure shows a combination of using the Z-band from decals together with the Y. So now we're pushing to the infrared. So it's actually a very similar piece of code as before. This is just defining the colors and again making this hex bin figure. And then which you can see here, very different uh, look. In particular, the stars get all bunched up in this little point. We, 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 didn't, we don't have any more this kind of elongated long stellar locus that we had before. So if I repeat again, uh, same thing as before, so I make a loop uh, to make it this six panel figure here. Uh, and then I kind of give it away just before, but the PSF panel, which uh, shows really clearly the stellar look is quite well separated now. So we basically can use a cut in Z minus Y is one color to say, well, these are probably stars. But what's going on with this cloud, we're still not sure. Uh, and then it's not quite as well defined in terms of sequence there. So we might think, should we combine this Z minus Y is one color with a color from the previous plot, which I've not done yet. So this is something we could always play with during the hack session. <laughs> okay. So the last thing uh, with this notebook here is to get image cutouts for interesting targets. 
so these cutouts actually are going to come from um, uh, a tool written by Dustin Lang and part of the decals team, and it's basically just creating URLs and downloading. Uh, so it's not an internal data lab cutout, which we also have a service to do that, but uh, here this is an example of outsourcing, in a sense, the cloud part. Okay, so I'm not going to go through this, but the idea is uh, this is just building a bunch of interesting selections. So what did I choose for interesting selections is I'm going, I'm going to ask that the type is PSF, so focusing on just this panel, and I'm going to use this Z minus Y is one color to pick, uh, I'm going to pick just six random in that little clump and six random in this cloud. So just, not, well, uh, it's actually little bands, I guess. So I'm choosing in two locations here. Just to see by visual in inspection, can we build an intuition at what's going on in these objects? So this is the result. Um, the wise PSF, of course, is not as sharp as the optical, okay? <laughs> I heard people laughing, are you laughing at the beautiful white pixels by any chance? <laughs> There's light in there, okay, real photo. <laughs> there so, let me try to show the color again. Okay, so this top part is the blue Z minus one uh, side, they're actually in that little, most likely in that little stellar locus, but I did just only select in the Z minus one, I did not select on a vertical axis. So you can see, they're supposed to be PSF, and they look like PSF, they're mostly just these little round things in the middle. Uh, and, uh, and these blue one means that the, they're not very bright and wise relative to Z-band, and Z-band is the red band of the color image. And then red means that they actually are brighter in wise given the Z-band. So indeed there's more light in the wise in this case, and they look a bit different. So the, uh, the red side is also this more diffuse cloud of points. So we're not sure if they're really stars. They're not on a stellar locus. So maybe there's something funny with these. Can they be like some blue compact galaxy? Maybe this is what these things are. I'm not sure, actually. So, so I don't know. So maybe somebody among you can figure it out. Because this takes me to the last thing, which is the last last thing, which is the hack ideas. So can we basically combine colors and shape together, but in a different way from what I've shown before, to improve the classification of objects into stars, galaxies, and quasars. Uh, it could be useful for some of them will have spectroscopy already from SDSS and BOSS. So we have at Data Lab ingested a version of the spectroscopic SDSS table, so you can actually do a joint query all, all within our Data Lab environment. Uh, and this way you can retrieve for some of them spectra, which then can confirm, for example, between a star and a QSO, they have quite different spectra. And also if you have a redshift measurement, of course, stars are at redshift zero, and then QSO would be further out. Um, another idea, and I have no idea where to start there, but you could think it could be fun to have a kind of visualization tool where you combine a plot that has maybe wise and optical colors, and maybe you can click on points and show some cutouts or select a region and get cutouts uh, more autom automatic. So right now, the cutouts I showed are just basically, they're randomly six selected, but I would just have to like, select a bunch of times, it's not very uh, practical. And then the last thing is, instead of just making these simple color-color plots, can we instead use all the parameters together and colors and bands and shapes and sizes to apply machine learning or random forest to identify categories of objects? So I guess, um, let's see. So I think this is, this is all for the scientific demonstration. And then if, I know there's a lot of hack ideas because I was looking at the Google Doc. Um, but if any of you want to either do some of the hack ideas we suggested or do other hack ideas that would take advantage of Data Lab, we do have, uh, as Kuhn mentioned in the beginning, we have user accounts uh, for that we can give out. Yeah, and a uh, stack of sheets of paper with usernames on them, so <coughs> take one and, and get started. Okay, let's thank all three of our speakers. And uh, before we move on.